Good morning. Uh, grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with all of you, whether you are watching live or you're watching this as a replay, so to speak, uh, later on today. Uh, happy Hump Day, everybody. We have made it uh, to Wednesday as we continue on our study of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this morning we will cover uh, chapter 5. Tonight we'll cover chapter 6. And as always, if you have missed any of the first four uh, studies we've done, they're all about uh, 20, 25 minutes long. Uh, but they're all available here on my uh, personal Facebook page. I also have set up a YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to go there, they'll all be archived there as well. So you can watch them all at one time and not have to hunt to try and find them uh, where, where, they, where they may be. You just go to YouTube and search my name, uh, Mark, M-A-R-C, O'Neill, O, apostrophe N, E-A-L. And you should be able to find my channel. Uh, and, and see all the stuff that I upload there. It's kind of funny to say channel because truthfully, if I had my own channel, it would probably mostly be Andy Griffith Show reruns, if not a uh, Carolina game uh, here and there. Uh, 6.05 on Saturdays would, of course, be, be wrestling. Uh, but in any event, uh, go there and find out the ones that you have missed or rewatch the ones um, that you uh, have already seen. And I would encourage you also is to go back uh, and read the chapters that we're talking about. And if there are questions that come to you, even after the video is done, you can always go back on and, and uh, send me a question, a comment, a concern, or whatever that it, it may be. Uh, but again, we're going to focus in on, on Chapter 5 uh, this morning. And one thing I want to say uh, right off, though, is I've talked, uh, I think yesterday, maybe the day before, about this whole concept of uh, social holiness, about how one of the reasons we're doing this is so that we can help maintain some semblance of uh, Christian community uh, amongst us because our worship opportunities have been uh, postponed or canceled. Our, our weekly meetings have been uh, postponed or canceled. So we're not having that opportunity to get together as a body of Christ in person uh, like, we, well, like we want to. Uh, John Wesley uh, wrote a number of sermons on the, the Sermons on the Mount uh, preached by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And on his fourth one, what's sometimes called his fourth discourse on the Mount, uh, Brother Wesley said that uh, he wants to show that Christianity is essentially a social religion. And that to turn it into a solitary religion is indeed to destroy it. He says, social religion, I mean, not only that it cannot subsist well, but it cannot subsist at all without society, without living, and with conversing with other men or, or women. And so what uh, the Reverend Wesley is saying here is that you can read your Bible yourself, you can pray yourself, you can do devotions yourself, but there's got to be an avenue, there's got to be some kind of outlet to gather together and converse with one another about things and matters of faith. Again, typically that's Sundays at worship, usually that's our Bible studies, usually it's our small groups, uh, but because those aren't meeting right now, that's what this forum is meant to be, for us to come together and get together and talk about uh, the Gospel of Luke. But, but hey, I wanna open it up to anything that might be on your mind. As we go through this thing, if there are prayer requests you have, uh, send me those. If there are things on your mind, uh, send me those. Uh, whatever it is that you have on your heart, on your mind, uh, send those to me, and we'll certainly take care of it. If not, during the course of this particular uh, um, lesson or the lessons as they continue to take place, uh, but then personally. And I can certainly uh, call you, text you, FaceTime you, whatever it is we need to, to have communication together. Now, having said all that, I want to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in an opening prayer. Gracious and Heavenly One, we give thanks to you for this day that you have given us, a new day full of promise and opportunities to be witnesses to your strength, your power, and your glory. We ask, Lord, that you be a part of this, this Bible study, part of these conversations that we're having, Lord. And we just ask that you help to open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to your word and to the discussion that we have about the Gospel of Luke. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are looking at chapter 5 today. It is uh, 39 verses in total uh, and is a good one. I mentioned yesterday that chapter 4 is one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Uh, chapter 5 is probably, if that's 1A, this is probably 1B. But this is where our Lord and Savior is starting to call his team together, starting to get his disciples uh, together. Uh, the story kind of has his bookends at the beginning. He calls Peter. At the end, he calls uh, Matthew the tax collector, although different names are used here. Uh, Peter is referred to as Simon. Uh, Matthew is referred to as Levi. But understand, this is the fisherman Peter and the tax collector Matthew that are being called in this particular uh, story. So we'll go through it here. Um, as always, uh, after I read the scripture, I'm going to 
read a little bit out of this devotion book I have, the daily readings of, of, of uh, the Gospels. And again, I want to encourage you that even if you have your Bible sitting in front of you wide open or you have your Bible app on your phone uh, up and ready to go, let's not look at it, right? Just listen to me as I read these words of Scripture. Have it to really, um, I don't know, flow into you, so to speak, to cover you in, in the gospel message here. I worry that sometimes if we're reading along while somebody else is reading it, we're not really taking it in. We're just trying to keep up. Right or just trying to see where uh, the translation I have differs from the translation that the preacher is reading. So let's not let's not read. Let's just listen. And if you need to adopt a posture of prayer while we do that, that's fantastic. But here now, uh, Luke chapter five. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, this is also the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, who we know as Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets for a catch. Let your nets down for a catch, excuse me. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. I want to stop here just real quick to mention something. The fact that Peter has more than one boat back in these days would make Peter something of a small business person. Okay, So when Peter is dropping everything to follow Jesus. It's not that he's just dropping his own personal nets and his own boat. He's basically dropping an entire small business that he has been running uh, with uh, Simon, with uh, James and John, sometimes called the Sons of Thunder. Uh, but in any event, think about what he's given up here to follow Christ. We talked in the, the uh, scripture last night on uh, Luke chapter 4 that he goes into his house and he heals uh, his mother-in-law. Well, that means also that Peter may or may not have a wife that is still living. So as the sole breadwinner or bread earner at that particular time, he would have been leaving that as well. So think about well, all that Peter is giving up to go and follow Christ. It's not just simply that he was a fisherman. He's giving up his very livelihood, his means of livelihood to go follow Christ. Verse 12, once when he was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he ordered him to tell no one. Go, he said, and show yourself to the priest. And as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing for a testimony to them. But now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he would withdraw to deserted places and pray. What will be interesting as we go through this study, I just want to stop here for a minute, is how many times Jesus goes away and prays. I think there's a lesson there for us, that no matter how busy Jesus was, no matter, no matter how many things that he was doing, no matter how, if popular is the right word, that, that he got, he still would take time to go off and pray. And so I think there's a lesson for all of us there to, for, to also take time to pray. Yes, we're all busy. Yes, we all have a number of things that we are in charge of or that we feel like we have to get done. But I don't want us to be busy being busy, right? I want us to make sure that we take time out of our day to pray. And it could be in the morning when you're taking a shower. It could be when you're brushing your teeth. It could be in the car driving to and from work. Uh, any quiet moments you find during the day is an opportunity for prayer. Verse 17, one day while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. 
Just then some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or to say stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen strange things today. I want to stop there real quick to point out two things. One, uh, the healing of this guy was both internal and external, right? Not only does Jesus heal his physical limitations, but by, by forgiving his sins, he's healing him also on the inside. And I think that we need to be wary of that uh, in our culture. Because we can certainly see when somebody is sick or struggling or having a hard time physically because they manifest it on the outward. What we don't always see is where someone might be, be struggling uh, on the inside. And this deals with matters of faith. It deals with matters of mental health. We've talked in our ordination process about the danger of the single story. And that if we see somebody acting in a certain way, we may automatically assume we know why. But it's very rare that we know why. So what we need to do as a Christian community is show everybody we come across grace, mercy, love, compassion, and support, right? That's what Jesus is doing here. But I understand that first he healed him on the inside, and that inner healing then allowed him to be healed on the outside. The same for us, right? I firmly believe um, that as far as being made well or being healed, it's mind, body, and soul, right? All uh, playing a role together. Second thing I want to point out about this story is that I've used it any number of times uh, speaking to our youth group or speaking at, at FCA doing devotions or when we go out to the Benjamin house and do chapel services out there and I preached on it one time in our, in our big services but there's a lesson here about the company you keep so to speak um, we don't know how many men were carrying these this mat right or this bed but they certainly and we don't know how far they walked but they were going to do everything they could to get their buddy to Jesus because they knew that he needed the healing and the love and the strength and the hope that only Jesus could provide. And so I'd ask our youth, I said, well, who do you run with, right? Who are you riding with? Are you riding with people who are going to carry you no matter what the price, no matter what the obstacle to get you to Jesus? If they see you struggling or see you uh, slipping or see you falling short in some way, make sure you surround yourself with the kind of people who are going to carry you to Jesus. And then on the flip side, you need to make sure that you are somebody who's going to carry your friends to Jesus, right? Be the ones that grab a hold of that mat or grab a hold of that bed and carry them to the Lord when you see them struggling or see them slipping or see them in need of the help that only our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, can provide. Verse 27, after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up left everything and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, I like that line. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Isn't that good news for each and every one of us? That Jesus is calling us to come to him. Verse 33. Then they said to him, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. 
He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says the old is good. So that is this chapter 5. A lot to unpack there, a lot that we could, could possibly talk about. Those last few verses there is where Jesus is simply saying, hey, I'm ushering in a new thing, right? I'm ushering in a, a new kingdom. When we have our uh, communion liturgy and we, um, we talk about the, the, the blood that was spilled and the cup that he offered to his disciples, he says what? This is the new covenant, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. The new wine, so to speak, is a new way of doing things. Hmm? When Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it, he's fulfilling it in a whole new way, right? ushering in a whole new kingdom of God, a kingdom that we live in right now, truthfully. But part of our duty is to show that love, show that kingdom to others who may not know of the glory of God. So I want to read a little bit out of the devotional today. This one focuses on the first 11 verses. If you want to go back and read those, chapter 5, the first 11 verses. The roughly, it's the story of when Jesus goes out, sees Peter, and calls him to be one of his disciples. It says, Our Lord had an unwearied readiness for every good work. Our Lord preaches to a crowd, not in any consecrated building or place set apart for public worship, but in the open air. Not in a pulpit constructed for the preacher's use, but in a fisherman's boat. Souls were waiting to be fed. Personal inconvenience was not allowed a place in his consideration. God's work must not stand still. And isn't that appropriate for our day and age, right? We may have our churches or the buildings rather being closed, but church is not closed. Each and every one of us still has the opportunity. We've talked so far in this study. Each and every one of us is a minister. Each and every one of us is part of the body of Christ. Each and every one of us has been given special giftings and callings to go out and, 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 and be of service to the Lord. So even though our sanctuaries may be closed on Sunday mornings and our small groups might not be meeting during the week, that does not mean that God's work stands still. God's work still continues apace, and it continues through you and through me in the ways that we go out and minister to those in our communities that may be suffering or having a hard time uh, during this, uh, this, uh, this uh, coronavirus uh, issue. It says, Servants of Christ should learn a lesson from the Master. We are not to wait until every little obstacle or difficulty is removed before we put our hand to the plow or go forth to sow the seed of the word. Let us work with the tools that we have. While we are lingering and delaying, souls are perishing. It is the slothful heart that is always looking at the hedge of thorns and the lion in the way. Where we are, and as we are, in season or out of season, by one means or another, by tongue or pen, by speaking or writing, let us strive to ever be working for God. Let us never stand still. Again, that's the purpose and point of this FaceTime Bible study that we're doing, right? We don't want to stand still. We don't want to get lazy. We can make excuses all day long about, well, I can't get out, can't do this, can't do whatever. But we still have an opportunity, a duty, I would say, to be in service to our Lord. It says, what encouragement our Lord gives to unquestioning obedience. Our Lord's command to Simon receives a reply which exhibits in a striking manner the mind of a good servant. Again, Simon says, all right, I'll come with you. And what was the reward of this ready compliance with the Lord's command? It says verse 6 tells us. And what verse 6 is, is when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. Right? The Lord rewarded Peter for his obedience. A practical lesson for all Christians is contained under these simple circumstances. We are meant to learn the lesson of ready, unhesitating obedience to every command of Christ. The path of duty may sometimes be hard and disagreeable. The wisdom of the course we follow may not be apparent to the world, but none of these things must move us. We are to go straight forward when Jesus says go, and do a thing decidedly, boldly, and unflinchingly when Jesus says do it. We are to walk by faith and not by sight, and believe that we Believe that what we see not now to be reasonable and right, we shall see hereafter. 
So acting we shall never find in the long run that we are losers. Sooner or later we shall reap a great reward. Again, another lesson for us now in this day and age, right? We may not see the, the need or the utility, possibly, of closing churches and not having meetings. It may not make sense to some of us. But in the long run, it's going to pay dividends, right? And I don't mean just by flattening the curve or whatever uh, expressions want to be used about trying to mitigate the, the harm done by the coronavirus. I mean that it is certainly possible that out of this brief time apart, that there may be a revival in our area of Christianity. We talked yesterday about the fact that sometimes Christianity is, is a little too easy for us. We know church is going to be there on Sunday. We know small groups are going to be there during the week. We know Bible study is going to be there during the week. And so maybe we take it for granted because it's always going to be there. Well, over these last couple of weeks, it's not been there. So is it possible that we're going to miss it so much that we stop taking it for granted? That there's going to be a, an explosion of uh, church attendance throughout our throughout our communities. Certainly possible, because I do know that God will work through this. Everything we're going through, God is working through and has his hand on it. We also need to just trust in that and understand that though we may not understand completely now, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. We need to trust in him that out of this is gonna come some benefit and some good for all of us. Then I wanna read this to you uh, just right quick. It says, a sense of God's presence abases man and makes him feel his sinfulness. This is strikingly illustrated by Peter's words when the miraculous drought of fishes convinced him that one greater than man was in the boat. So again, in verse 8, uh, Peter says what? He says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It reminds me of back in the book of Isaiah when Isaiah is in the presence of the Lord and at first he rejoices, but then he shrinks back and says, Get away from me, for I am a sinful man. Then on both occasions... God chooses that person. Remember in Isaiah, God calls out, hey, who's going to go out for us? And Isaiah says, I'll do it. Here I am, send me. And then here Jesus says, I'm going to take you, Peter, make you fisher, a fisher of man. Follow me. And Peter says, yes, I will do that. Isn't it uh, somewhat um, comforting to know that even in our sinful nature, our sinful, imperfect selves, God is going to call every one of us to be in use for his kingdom says, in measuring these words of Peter, we must, of course, remember the time at which they were spoken. He was, at best, a babe in grace, weak in faith, experience, and knowledge. At a later period of his life, he would doubtless have said, abide with me and not depart. In other words, as he grew in his faith, he certainly would have said, Jesus, stay with me. He would not have said, get away from me. I'm a sinful person. But still, after every deduction of this kind, the words of Peter exactly express the first feelings of men when they are brought into anything like close contact with God. The sight of divine greatness and holiness makes him feel strongly his own littleness and sinfulness. Like Adam after the fall, his first thought is to hide himself. Like Israel, he fears to die in God's presence. Let us strive to know more and more, every year we live, our need of a mediator between ourselves and God. Let us seek more and more to realize that without a mediator, our thoughts of God can never be comfortable. And the more clearly we see God, the more uncomfortable we feel. Above all, let us be thankful that we have in Jesus the very mediator our souls require. Out of Christ, God is a consuming fire. In Christ, he is a reconciled father. Jesus holds out a mighty promise to Peter. The promise was intended for all faithful ministers of the gospel who walk in the apostles' steps. It was spoken for their encouragement and consolation, to support them under that sense of weakness and unprofitableness by which they are sometimes almost overwhelmed. They are often tempted to give up in despair and to leave off preaching. But here stands the promise, which is in verse 10, when Jesus tells Peter, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. Again, this is the Lord saying, I'm going to give you everything you need, man, all the strength that you need to, to be successful in your task. It says, let us pray that all ministers may preach the same gospel Peter preached and live the same holy life he lived. Only such ministers will ever prove successful fishermen. Again, that's all of us, friends. Every one of us is a minister of the gospel message. We may have different gifts and different talents, but we're all certainly ministers of of the gospel message. And so I just ask you as you go into times of prayer today, pray for your community. Pray for the people in your churches. Pray for the people out of your churches. 
pray for your preachers. Um, because I'll be honest, this is a very odd time for all of us. Uh, because instead of getting ready for public worship uh, and a gathering of worship on Sundays, we're getting ready for online worship. And it's a little bit different. It's different for you guys. It's different for us as well. In addition to that, we constantly have this reminder that we are a praying people. And so as preachers of the gospel, we are praying for everyone in our congregation, everyone in our community, that this coronavirus just pass us by. So it is a little bit draining. It's a little bit tiring. Uh, rest assured that your preacher is not just sitting around with his feet up taking two weeks off. <laughs> your preacher is working as hard, if not harder, uh, than he or she was before this whole coronavirus uh, uh, thing hit us. So be in prayer for everybody. Be in prayer for your preachers. Be in prayer for your churches. Be in prayer uh, for your communities. So that wraps up uh, Luke uh, chapter 5. Again, tonight, roughly 7 o'clock-ish, we'll tackle Luke uh, chapter 6. Again, if you've missed any of the chapters so far, you can find the videos here on my Facebook page. You can go to the YouTube channel I have set up. Just search my name, Mark with a C, O-N-E-A-L, -E -E -L. You'll find the channel. You'll find all the other uh, videos there. You'll even find our worship service from this past Sunday if you want to uh, watch that as well. Um, let me now close us in prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for this Bible study and this time that we have together. Help us, Lord, as we go about our day today to find those places where we are being called to be in service, to be in ministry, to be in mission for you. Father, we just ask you to continue to protect all of us, our family, our friends, our communities from this coronavirus. And Father, we just ask that you continue to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit to go about our days being disciples that make disciples. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, we will see you tonight, seven-ish or so. We'll tackle Luke chapter six. Have a good Wednesday. God bless.